and we are back to reading the War Brothers, uh, chapter 10. This one is called God. Adam was dead. Time whirled and swirled around Jacob. It ebbed and flowed, grew into a mountain, and crashed down on him like a giant rough wave. As soldiers cheered and young mothers danced, Jacob stood motionless. Commander Opiro held up his hand and waited for silence. It came in an instant. Straighten this line. The boys scrambled to do as they were told. Commander Opiro stood front and center and rocked on his heels, hands clasped behind his back. This boy, here. The commander kicked Adam's body. Why did this boy have to be killed? He paused as if waiting for an answer. When none was offered, he carried on. He was killed because he was wounded and weak. God only wants strong soldiers to march for him. We are at war. We are fighting to defend your country. You have not joined us by your own free will, even though we fight for you. So we will force you to do your duty. The commander paced back and forth, tapping his fingers on the handgun on his holster. Only soldiers eat. If you want to eat, you will join us. This is your choice. If you die of hunger, it is your choice. If you steal food, you will be killed. And do not think the government soldiers will save you. You will walk, walk, and walk. The government soldiers will not find you. Look around. See our women and our children? These are the pure children born of LRA commanders. The day will come when these pure children will rule a trolley land. Again, he paused, caught his breath, then started again. We have existed a long time. Musa, sorry. Musa Envy calls himself the president of Uganda, but he has no power here. The Ugandan army thinks they are strong. They have helicopters, trucks, tanks, and powerful missiles and guns, but they have no victory. Why? Because God is not on their side. God is on our side. The commander held his fist in the air as the rebel soldiers lifted their guns and gave a great cheer. The commander paused and looked at each of the students with contempt. He took a breath and continued. You have come from school, so you think you are smart. You are not smart, you are stupid. You think that if you speak English here, you will not be understood and can therefore plot your escape. But we are smarter. If you speak English, you will be killed. If you try and escape, you will be killed. If you do escape, the government soldiers will kill you. You belong to the Lord's Resistance Army. Let us pray. Pray? One boy looked to another. Pray? Rifle butts slammed into their backs. On your knees. Jacob was too slow. Lizard slugged Jacob in the back of the head. He pitched forward and fell. The pain in his head returned with a vengeance. You must face the east to pray to God, because that is where God lives shouted Commander Opiro, hands together. Now lower your head until it touches the ground. Why? This was a Muslim tradition. Jacob knew that. All the boys knew. Coney's Christianity was a stew. They prayed. Ten minutes later, they were ordered to stand and sing Onward Christian Soldiers. Most of the boys knew the words by heart, and those that did not pretended. Onward Christian Soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Tony, breathless, eyes blank, sang the loudest of all. Jacob caught a glimpse of Norman. The boy's mouth opened and closed, but no words came out. Most of the boys clumped together. Everyone knew each other. Norman was a new boy. He had no one. Lizard cocked his gun and pointed it at Jacob and Paul. They sang loudly. When the last verse died on their lips, the commander spoke again. He looked up to the sky. His voice rose up to the heavens. His hands reached for the clouds. You are in God's army now. If you fail to do your duty, if you fail God, you will burn in a fiery hell forever. Now you will learn how to be soldiers. The woman stood and edged back towards the hut. Jacob's heart began to pound. The air seemed to still itself. How was it birds did not sing or animals chatter in this place? What did he mean? Now you will learn to be soldiers. Listen to me. The voice was a hiss in Jacob's ear. Jacob twisted around to see the source of the voice. Don't turn around. Just answer me. What is your name? 
name. Jacob hesitated. Jacob, my name is Jacob. Are you the boy from the church? Yes, Oteka, is that you? He whispered. Yes, it is me. Do as I say. You will be beaten, but you will live if you do not cry out. It will only hurt in the beginning, but no matter what, do not make a sound. Tell your friends. Hear me. If you want to live, do not cry out. A group of ragged soldiers emerged from the huts. Every one of them was carrying something. A stick, a piece of leather, a bit of bicycle chain, a length of vine coated in oil. None of the soldiers looked older than 15. Remove your shirts. All over the age of 16 will receive 30 lashes. Those under 16 will receive 25 lashes, shouted the commander. Paul, Jacob whispered, don't make a sound. Tell Tony. He turned his head. Where was Norman? Jacob cursed under his breath. The boy was not his problem. They were not friends. They had only just met. But where was he? Then another boy from school took a step forward. There was Norman, standing behind him. Jacob sidestepped towards him, keeping his eyes on the commander and lizard. When he was close enough to be heard, Jacob hissed Norman, no matter what, do not cry out. One student after another was forced down in the dirt. The only sound after that were the swishes of the weapon as they slapped against skin. Father, 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 come. Chapter 11, Nayuma Guka. The sky lightened, even though the sun had not yet made an appearance. Jacob heard monkey chatter and bird twitter, but there was no movement from the surrounding huts. There was no one about, no guards. Why bother with guards? when not one of them could walk, let alone run away. Paul? Jacob cried out, but then lowered his voice. Paul? The smallest movement set ripples of pain through his body. I am here, Paul mumbled. Tony? Jacob whispered. Paul lifted his head out of the dust and looked over at Tony. There were moans, but no one spoke. Tony, is he alive? Jacob spat out each word as if it were glass. Yes, I saw him moved. Paul used all his strength to answer. Norman? There was no answer. Norman? Jacob called out. Still no response. Then a mumble. He was alive, too. A jug of water sat in the dirt a few feet away. All he had to do was crawl toward it. Jacob startled out, hand over hand, dragging his lower body as if he were paralyzed from the waist down. Each inch was a mile. Face, nose, eyes, mouth all caked in dust, hard to breathe. His hands shook as he tipped the jug just a little. Water splashed over his face and dribbled into his mouth. The water stank of dung, but no matter. He drank, vomited, then drank again. The jug left a trail in the sand as he dragged it back to the line of boys, and then he saw them, sniffling, a pack of spot, sorry, sniffing, a pack of spotted hyenas, sloped back, cat-like, powerful jaws. Jacob reared up and howled. They were not yet dead. The pack skulked away. Norman lay face down, nails dug into the dirt, legs extended in the dust. Jacob crawled towards him. Norman, wake up. Jacob reached into the jug, cupped his hands, and splashed water on Norman's face. Drink, drink. They will come for us. Jacob pushed his face against Norman's ear and sobbed, Listen to me, the army, our fathers, they will come, just drink. His arms quivered as he tipped the jug to Norman's lips. Norman didn't move. He just lay very still. Wake up! Jacob's sob turned into a cry. He was just a kid, a stinking kid who was good at multiplication. Norman, what is 66 times 15? Jacob hissed into his ear. Nothing. He said nothing. Tell me, tell me. 66 times 15. You can see them. I know you can see them. Picture the numbers. See them. 66 times 15. Norman coughed and squished his eyes shut. 990. Jacob's head pounded. What was the answer? No matter. Yes, yes, you're right. You got it right. Drink, now drink. I want to go home. Norman sobbed. It was a simple request of a child. And then it struck him. Norman, how old are you? Ten. Jacob swore under his breath. Ten years old. Just a little kid. Mr. Ojok must have thought that if he lied about Ormond's age, the boys would be more likely to befriend him. 
Don't cry. Don't cry. You must be quiet. Can you hear me? You must be quiet. Jacob looked down at Norman. It wasn't fair. How was he supposed to take care of a kid? What did he know about caring for anyone? He didn't have any brothers or sisters or even a pet. Jacob looked up to the morning sky. The air was still. He took a breath and the pain of drawing air into his lungs almost made him cry out. Look, Norman, we will stick together, okay? Just do not make noise. Hear me? Slowly, Norman nodded. Paul, drink. Again, Jacob wiggled through the dust, cupped his hands under the spout of the jug, and dribbled the liquid into Paul's gaping mouth. Norman crawled alongside, as if afraid to be more than a few inches away from Jacob. Paul gulped the foul liquid, then turned his face back to the ground. Listen, we have to stay together. We have to try to keep each other safe. We are brothers. We are family. Jacob's reached for Paul's, then Norman's hand. Jacob spoke as loudly as he dared. There was still no movement from the huts, but he could hear the peeps and squeaks of small children as they began to wake. Swear to God, swear to each other, swear that we are brothers. Jacob's voice was steady, although the pain in his back made it hard to breathe properly. As best they could, Paul and Norman bobbed their heads and mumbled, I swear. Jacob looked over at Tony. His mind told him that Tony was innocent. In that place, they might all have done what he did, but his heart and something else. He could not forget the sight of Tony raising the log over his head to kill Adam. Soft clapping had begun. It was the girl's way of announcing that the day had started and it was time to walk. Jacob passed the water jug down the line. Each boy took a sip, then one by one they struggled to stand. With strength Jacob hadn't thought he had, he hauled Norman to his feet. Paul staggered up on his own. Again, they formed a ragged line and began the parade out of the village and into the bush. Nayuma Juka, left, right, left, right. The words were hummed and lodged in the brain until it was difficult to hear what was actually said and what was thought. The smell, sickly sweet, what is it? The huts along the edge of the village had been burned to the ground and only black rings in the dirt remained. Where were the people? Oh, God, no. Jacob turned his eyes away. Since Jacob had climbed onto his bed at school, his prayers, and thought about making the football team or winning the math mathematics award, 24 hours had passed. 122 times 85 equals 10,370. 333 times 22 equals 7,326. 245 times 67 equals 16,415. Don't turn around. Take this and give it to your friends. Only friends. Trust no one. As Jacob walked, Oteka had come up from behind and pushed herbs into his hand. Jacob said nothing. Without being told, he knew not to talk to Oteka, not directly. Jacob lifted the herbs to his nose and sniffed. Lewit o put leaves. Ethel used them to brew a tea when he was sick. She said it took, pain, took away pain better than the white tablets the white doctor in the town gave out. Jacob bit into the herb. Almost instantly, his mouth went numb. He edged up to Norman, then Paul. No chewing, Jacob murmured as he slipped the herb into their hands. Do not let them see you chew. He looked over to Tony, but Tony did not look up or around. He just moved one foot in front of the other. He didn't seem to be in pain, at least not on the outside. The sun grew high in the sky. Nayupa Guka, left, right, left, right. It was late afternoon now. Nayuma Guka, left, right, left, right. They stopped to pray. On your knees, forehead to the ground, face east. Twice, Jacob saw Oteka with the commanders. He was easy to spot because he stood head and shoulders taller than the rest. As night fell, the boys slumped against trees or crawled under bushes to sleep. Oteka squatted on the other side of Jacob's tree and whispered in the dark, Do not turn around, just listen. You must know what happens next. You must know how they attack. You must be prepared. Jacob tensed. Norman was asleep, but he could see Paul shift in the shadows, awake and listening. Tony. Where was Tony? He too was asleep, curled up like a cat. How did you come to be here? Jacob asked Oteka. The question plagued Jacob. That does not matter now. You must listen. There are four brigades in Coney's army, and a commander rules each one. Under his command are families, wives and children, and all the soldiers and slaves. 
Each commander is all-powerful and can kill anyone he chooses. Attacks on a village are always the same. Surround it. Squeeze it tight. Kill the very young and the very old. They have guns, but use bullets only when necessary. Bullets are to fight government soldiers, not villagers. Often the old people are murdered when, where they sit, outside their huts. Oteka paused to listen for footsteps. He heard nothing and so carried on. Sometimes every single person in the village is killed and their food is taken. Jacob was sitting, but he felt lightheaded as if he might faint. But the villagers, I mean, do they fight back? Asked Jacob. A few try, but just seeing the automatic weapons makes them afraid. Most just accept their fate or are so dazed they cannot move. The bigger boys and girls are captured and made to carry off the food. The animals are stolen or killed. The rebels poison the wells so no one can live there anymore. Only the children who can become slaves, wives, or soldiers are taken. Some are traded to the Sudanese. You must know this. You must be prepared. We must run away, whispered Jacob. The girl with no ears had instilled fear in all of them, but what was that compared to what they now faced? We could run to a village, warn them. They would help us. Even as he said the words, Jacob felt the foolishness of the idea. Some villagers might help, but most will not. Too much killing has been done by the rebels for villagers to trust. Jacob tried to digest this information before asking, Where are we? Why can, why can the government soldiers not find us? He was desperate. This didn't make sense. That is why we walk all the time, never stopping so the army cannot find us. But listen, this is most important. Do not stay too close to your friends. The rebels do not like you to have loyalties. Be careful when you talk to each other. There was a snap of a branch. Jacob turned his head towards the sound as Oteka slipped back into the night. Oteka? He hissed into the dark, gone. Paul moved closer to Jacob. Is he your friend? I do not know. I think so. How do you know him? asked Paul. I just know his name, Oteka. Why is he helping us? Skepticism crept into Paul's voice. I helped him once, that is all. But what he says is true. I feel it, whispered Jacob. I feel it too. Jacob leaned against the tree. Something Oteka had said came back from him, came back to him. He'd hardly noticed at the time. Oteka had said, the rebels poison the wells so no one can live there anymore. He does not think himself a rebel, Jacob whispered. What did you say? Paul's voice was heavy with sleep. Nothing. Both boys fell silent. And after a while, Paul slept. Jacob looked up to the stars, listening to the old men in his father's courtyard share their horror and sorrow about Coney, hearing Musa Henry Torak talk about his much-loved grandson. Jacob had felt nothing, nothing for the children that the rebels stole, nothing for their misery or their deaths, nothing for the people they were forced to kill. He had only thought, what does it have to do with me? Why should I care? Jacob covered his face with his hands. I did not know. Forgive me. I did not care to know. Chapter 12. Two weeks later. There was a routine to their days. The clapping of hands announced it was time to leave camp. Not once had they woken up in the morning and gone to sleep at night in the same place. Nayuma Guka. Left, right, left, right. As soldiers and students, girls and babies, slaved and, slaves and goats trudged through the bush, Commander Opiro and his band of sergeants climbed on to, into a truck with loppy tires and drove down a rutted paths until they reached furrowed roads. From there, the truck disappeared from view. Scouts led the way through the bush. The scouts were small boys who were well fed and ran fast. Some were paces ahead, some hours ahead. Everyone has a designated job. Jacob, Norman, and Paul were slaves, like most of the schoolboys. The slaves carried all manner of things, bedrolls, tents, cooking pots, spare guns without bullets, pails, chairs, old red plastic gasoline cans filled with gritty water, crates of live chickens. Wounded soldiers were carried in gunny sacks strung between poles. Most died of their wounds since there was no first aid. There was none to give. Anyone else who was hurt or wounded was left to die. Only soldiers were buried. Jacob carried a jerry can filled with water. 
water they were not allowed to drink. Paul hoisted a battered suitcase on his head and held a pail of cow slop in his free hand. Norman was given the most difficult job, to carry, to carry a jug of oil. The jug was big, maybe 30 liters. It took two boys to hoist it up and place it on a coiled rope on Norman's head. It seemed to press down on him, making Norman appear even smaller than he really was. He looked like an ant scurrying under a load twice his size. Neither Jacob nor Paul had a way to lessen his burden. The day was long, the walk endless. They needed to stop, to rest. Jacob, water. Norman spoke like a runner after a long race, breathless and exhausted. Together, Jacob and Paul lifted a jug of oil, lifted the jug of oil off Norman's head. Norman slumped forward. Jacob pulled leaves off the underbrush and held it up to Norman's mouth. The dew on the leaves had already evaporated, but Norman sucked the leaves anyways. Food. They needed food. They ate what they could scavenge along the way. Insects, wild fruits, and lizards. Difficult to catch and harder still to skin. Here. Jacob broke twigs off a tree. Norman stuck one in his mouth and bit down. They all sucked on wooden sticks to keep the hunger and thirst away. Jacob saw something belong beyond the elephant grass. Wait, I'll be back. He batted the grass aside and raced down a slippery path towards a muddy water hole. There, he scooped up a handful of mud and ran it back to moisten Norman's cracked lips. Norman, it will be all right. Over and over, Jacob whispered these words in Norman's ear, and sometimes Paul's ear too. Help is coming, we just have to wait. The scouts kept returning with bad news. More and more villages they came upon had been abandoned, so there was no food to steal. On days when a scout did return with the news that there was a village ahead, an assault team was formed and off they went into battle. Except, there was no real battle. They just killed the villagers and made off with their food, animals, and sometimes children. Some days they fought off government soldiers. Seldom were the schoolboys involved in these fights. Girls, small children, slaved, and those who had yet to prove themselves in batter, battle were told to sit in the long elephant grass and wait. Since Commander Opiro was seldom around, Lizard and another rebel named Eddie gave the orders. Tony and the other boys who had killed Adam had guns. Not little wooden training guns either, real guns. It was as if the commanders were trying to make them special, different from the students and different from the regular recruits who had to train for weeks before getting a real gun. Tony slung his gun across his back and walked a few paces ahead of Jacob. The metal of the gun must have grown hot under the sun because Jacob could see the blistered burn marks on Tony's neck and upper arms. The scouts had seen another village and Lizard ordered the assault team to move out. Tony was part of the team. He marched away with his head hanging down. It was hours before they came back, and when they did, Tony was more dirty and distant than ever. Tony! Jacob tried to get his attention. Tony would not look him in the eye, would not even acknowledge his existence. Oteka crouched in the elephant grass and motioned to Jacob. Come, come, he hissed. Jacob crawled towards him, head swiveling, eyes looking every which way. Do not trust him, Oteka said. He is a rebel now. As always, Oteka would whisper news or warning, then disappear. During the day, Tony walked behind Lizard, but at night, he always seemed to want to be near the boys from school. Maybe Oteka was right. Maybe Tony could not be trusted. Maybe Tono Tony was spying on them, but maybe not. When the boys were too exhausted to move, they were told to sit and listen. A rebel leader was their teacher. He was short, wore torn and soiled army clothes, and stomped around the clearing swearing and yelling. Perhaps he was 20 years old. Tony and the other students who had proven to be good soldiers sat right up front. The teacher, if he could be called such a thing, held guns up in each hand and waved them like flags. He pointed out anti-tank mines and anti-personnel mines and rocket launchers with red tails. The guns had English alphabet letters, SPGs, SMGs, B-10s, and there were SAM-7 missiles and RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades that could puncture armor. The boys learned to dismantle and assemble the guns and clean them too. Their teacher finished the lessons by screaming, you will obey your commander above all else. 
The very best soldiers are given many wives. If you prove yourself in battle, you too will be given many wives. Wives? Who would want a wife? Then came more threats, more yelling. But it was so hard to listen, so hard to stay awake, so thirsty, so hungry. At the end of each day, after walking, 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 after lessons in guns and soldiering, and after prayers, Jacob, Paul, and Norman slumped down, too numb to speak. All the students of the George Jones Seminary were sickening for home. The cuts on their backs were healing, but the itching was unbearable. They crumpled under a jackfruit tree. Norman's eyes rolled back in his head. Norman, are you all right? Jacob would ask again and again, and Norman would nod over and over. Every day, Norman seemed to grow smaller. Hope. He was losing hope. Jacob had to do something, anything, to make Norman and Paul think of something else. But what? Do not think about home. Do not think about the people who care, that people that care for you are far away. How far? Hard to know. Think of something else entirely. He had an idea. Jacob looked around. The soldiers were eating and paying them no mind. He motioned to Paul and Norman to come close. Paul, tell us about America, whispered Jacob. Norman perked up just a tiny bit and edged in still closer. Paul's eyes widened in surprise. Then he shook his head. It was hard, too hard to think about that other life. Tell us about their clothes, Jacob egged him on. Paul thought for a minute, then said, in America, Many people wear strange things on their heads, hats of all kinds, caps too, some round and others made of wool, no matter what the temperature. Jacob nodded. There were lots of books in the school library that were sent from people in America. One book was called The Cat in the Hat. Jacob looked up into the darkening sky and pictured white people all over America wearing tall, stripy hats. And they have every color of hair, yellow and orange and blue. Some of it sticks up in points. Many have long hair that curls. Blue hair? Jacob almost laughed. Is everyone rich in America? To Jacob's amazement, it was Norman who asked the question. I think so. Everyone uses electricity. Even children are allowed to touch the switch on the wall. There's a lot of electricity. The ground is covered in cement and there are no cows. There are no animals anywhere, except dogs. They walk dogs at the end of a long rope and the dogs are made to wear clothes. And the little kids are impolite to their parents, and they don't get beaten. Both Jacob and Norman sucked in their breath. Imagine being rude to a parent and not being punished. But dogs wearing clothes? How could that be? For a minute it worked. For a sliver of time, their thoughts were elsewhere. Nayuma Guka, left, right, left, right. The rainy season had arrived, slowly at first, droplets in the middle of the day. The drops turned to showers, the showers turned into storms, and color was brought into existence. And when the rain abated, there were green mango trees standing under a yellow sun that shone down on the red earth. The rain should have cooled their skin, but it did not. It was hot, sticky water that evaporated in an instant. The ground became slippery scarlet rivers of muck. Muck caked their feet, ran up their legs, splattered onto their faces and eyes, sitting in mud, sleeping in mud, mud for food, mud for brains. Lightning threatened, thunder clapped, and the rain came down. They walked, multiplying helped. Only in a civilized world did numbers mean anything. 89 times 99 equals 8,811. 66 times 97 equals 6,402. Nayamaguka, left, right, left, right. Jacob's shirt stuck to him like a crust. His eyes would not come off. His, his shoes would not come off. His feet were so swollen that his ankles bulged and his toes curled under. The only way to remove his shoes easily would be to cut them off. And then what? He looked down at Norman's bare feet. Gingerly, with his mouth clamped shut to hold in a cry, Jacob strained and yanked off his shoes. Jacob worked the shoes onto Norman's feet. They lasted a few days, then fell apart, leaving Norman barefoot again. When he could, Jacob washed Norman's feet in muddy streams and checked for infection. At least Norman didn't have chiggers, ticks, 
that burrowed into feet and ate up the foot from the inside out. Norman, can you feel this? Jacob flicked the soles of Norman's feet with his fingers. Norman shook his head. Jacob made shoes for Norman out of banana leaves. He whispered as he wrapped the leaves around Norman's feet and tied them with vines. Norman, what is 154 times 29? Norman shook his head. What is 12 times 10? 120, he whispered. Good. That is good. Paul was barefoot too. His shoes were now on the feet of a soldier. 95 times 78 equals 7,410. Maybe. To pass the time, Jacob counted the number of soldiers and students in their unit. There were 200 soldiers, slaves, and women in their group, including the 37 students from George Jones. That number swelled and shrank. Sometimes they met up with other units of the LRA, and more soldiers joined them. Naomaguka, left, right, left, right. The only relief came at night. Did you hear? A boy came out of the dark and squatted in front of Jacob and his friends. His name was Abraham, another student from their school. Abraham shuffled closer to Jacob and whispered, Coney is nearby. They say that he will inspect the troops. Abraham was jubilant. He was beginning to turn, beginning to see a place for himself as a rebel soldier. It was starting to happen to too many students. The lies told by the commanders were starting to take root. We should pray that he comes to bless us. Abraham leapt up and went off to spread the gossip to the next group. What do you think Coney is like? whispered Paul. There were rumors that Coney had magical powers, that he had 30 wives and 200 children and lived like a king in the, in the Sudan. Some said that he was three meters tall, while others said that he was powerfully built with the body of a mighty warrior. The next day came and went, and the day after that, and still, Coney did not come. And we will stop there.